Good morning, church. Go ahead, have your Bibles open. Go to Romans 8. We're only going to be in one place in the Bible this whole morning, but we're going to be flipping around. We're going to be all over that chapter. We're going to be pressing fast forward, rewind, but I only want you in that space. Now, when you open up your Bible, I am a firm believer, as you know. I'm a firm believer in the highlighter. I'm a firm believer in the journaling and the note-taking. And when you turn to Romans 8 and you have your Bibles open this morning, as you take a deep breath of fresh air and calm your nerves and ready to dive into God's Scripture for encouragement and wisdom, I want you to take the note of what is more important to you this morning 2020, in the context of everything that is happening, what's more important to you this morning? Hope or answers? Hope or answers? And as we dive into Romans 8 from Paul, literally driven by the Word of God, and we dive into the song of our choice today in Christ alone, we're going to be diving into the beautiful truths that music points us to in the glory of God's hope. So write that down. Where does hope come from? Where does hope come from? This morning, before we read and pray, I don't know about you, but I'm in need of hope. I'm in need of encouragement. I would like answers, but as I was just talking to someone earlier today, with all of the worldly answers given to us, who's going to be president? When's the virus going to end? How will my family be? When will I be better? All of those things. When will normalcy regain itself? With all of those answers answered without hope, we are in no better place. The church believers, we are desperately in need of hope. Hope is essential. So have your Bibles open. We're going to start with Romans 8, 18, and 19. These are some amazing verses of encouragement and faith building and hope producing. So make sure your Bible's open and listen to these first two verses. Starting with verses 18. Paul tells us, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. And highlight that. These are some of the most encouraging words that you will find in all of Scripture. Whatever that is happening to you today, whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're feeling, however your emotions are stirred, whatever's going on, consider that the sufferings, the negative, the heartbreak, all of the difficulties and the struggles, all of the unanswered questions are not worthy. None of the question marks, all of the faith, None of the worthy are worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectations of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, when I read those verses, I don't know about you, but those are some amazing, faith-growing, hope-producing, encouraging words. That, Hunter, no matter how stressed you are, no matter how sick, no matter how normalcy does not seem present in today's time, no matter how real the struggle is, none of those things are worthy to be compared to tomorrow. The glory, the promises of God that one day that we will experience is as believers, as children of the Almighty King. Now, when I read those verses, not only am I encouraged, but honestly, my my curiosity is spiked. I have questions in my mind. I I don't doubt them. Um, I don't debate them. I believe Paul's words. I believe in every little word that we see in 18 and 19. However, at the same time, I read those verses and my human heart says, how? How can this be? Because all I know is 2020. All I know is I see normalcy not rehear. All I know is people are getting sick and people are dying and people are struggling and our country's in chaos and all of those things. How can this be real? And my mind goes to curiosity. My mind goes to questions of what will the promises of God look like? What will heaven be like? What will glory feel like? Man, not only am I encouraged, but questions come to my mind. Not only how can this be so, but also my mind goes to how can I, a sinful, broken man who still lives in all of the struggle being real, 2020, just like you at home, 
How can I live and operate and walk daily with this mindset being natural? How can I be this way? How can I act and speak with such confidence and genuineness that whatever struggle comes my way, that my mind is so set on the future glory that none of it boggles me down? How can that be? Write it down. Where does hope come from? Where does it come from? Is it us lacing it up and, and, and grinding through? Is it us strengthening our hearts, girding up our loins, church, like Peter did? Is that where hope comes from? Or are we going to see in today's scripture that hope comes from something even greater than your strength and my effort? I believe we're going to see something even better, even better news than our effort and strength this morning. Now, when we look at Romans 8, understand that the theme of Romans 8 is really the liberation that the Holy Spirit is doing in our soul, the freedom, the peace, the glory that he is already transforming in our hearts and our minds and how we act. That is the theme of Romans 8, but understand that's not the themes of Romans 7. If you look at Romans 7, there is a scripture in this book where Paul is talking about his own struggle with trying to please God, trying to be faithful, trying to be peaceful, trying to live a righteous life. And even though his desire is to do those things, he continues to fall. He continues to choose sin. He continues to struggle. So our desire this morning is to be people of not Romans 7, to be people transformed, to live with a genuine new mindset and transformation of Romans 8. How can I live in a way that these aren't just words that I agree with, but how in 2020, going into 2021, can I live genuinely, naturally transformed, hope-filled, peace-driven of Romans 8? 18. How can we do this? In 2 Corinthians, I love the words Paul says once again, where the Spirit of the Lord is, that is where freedom is. Not in your strength, not in your patience, not in your wisdom, not in your experience, not in your back pocket, not in your family name, but where the Lord is. Where does hope come from? In Christ alone is where hope comes from. I was speaking to a great friend of mine over the week, last week, and I asked him a question. I said, what are the long-term effects of everything going on right now? This is a friend that I love. He's, he's older than I am. He's wiser than I am. He's way more experienced than I am. He's more patient than I am. He's a lot more than I am. And I wanted to get his opinion. I said, brother, talk to him nightly. What is the outcome of everything we're experiencing right now? I mean, you look at politics, what's the outcome there? If you look at COVID, when's this going to end? Is the medicine going to wipe everything away? What are the long-term effects of everything we're facing right now, physically and health-wise? Socially, what are the long-term effects? Mental health-wise, education, economy, our job force, what are the long-term effects of the church? When I look at the church, I'm not used to seeing so many empty seats right now at, at Eastview. If you don't know, if you haven't been a part of our church, if you are listening from another state or country, like we are so packed to capacity that we're literally getting ready to build. And now every Sunday I'm seeing less and less and less and less, understandably so. And I understand the struggle right now with being in crowds, but I look at this and go, what are the long-term effects of the church? Are we going to have to rebuild? When all of this normalcy comes back, are we going to have to go back out there and, and rebuild what we once had? And even if you say yes, or even if you say no, there's probably going to be some type of some extent to that, Hunter, whatever your answer is. But what will be the long-term effects? Will people naturally return to the church? Will our country, will our country find peace? Will we find resolution? Will we see long-term, and I don't mean six months, I mean six years. Will we see long-term obvious effects of 2020? Mental health and education, the family our workforce, whatever it is, will we see long-term effects? 
One thing that I do feel very confident about, guys, even though I'm not against medicine coming, I welcome it. But I do know that this vaccine that comes, it's not going to sweep everything under the rug. There's still going to be short and long-term effects to all of this. What is needed? What is needed for the believer this morning? Hang on every word. What is needed? Answers are hope. Which one do you need more? Who's going to be our president? When's this going to end? When will happiness find me? When will the church be filled? When can we go to Florida? All of those questions that you might have, what means more to you? What do you need most? Hope or answers? I would tell you as your pastor and the man speaking and pleading with you today as believers, I pray you, you seek hope. Because as I said earlier, if you had every answer that man has questions to right now without hope, I think you'd be just as lost. This morning in Romans 8 and in this beautiful song in Christ alone, we are going to seek hope and we're going to see where hope comes from. When obviously you and I are individuals at times like Paul in Romans 7, where we go, man, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm still falling, I'm still sinning, I'm still struggling. We're going to pray that we seek to be people like Romans 8, where we go, hey, this struggle is not compared to the glory which is to come. And that's a genuine mindset that God has done in me. Hope is not just something that I strive for. Hope is something that I have. And we're going to dive into where that hope comes from. Each week, if you haven't been here with us um, for at least the month of November, we've been diving into amazing biblical songs. Praise music, worship, eyes closed, hands up, type worship. It's been great. Brother Brent brought one Sunday. I've preached two. We've gone over amazing grace. We've gone over songs that are older in lyrics and some that are newer. As I was studying this week's song, In Christ Alone, I was reminded, as I am every week, to what we've been telling you of how music, how songs, how lyrical truths and praise has this phenomenal ability to pull our hearts, to stir our affections to a moment in time, to a moment in time, to an emotion that's needed, to a truth, even to hope, how a song filled with biblical truths and lyrics, biblical promises, faith-driven, peace-driven, all of those things can drive us, can stir our affections to hope, not just emotions. As I studied the song, I was also driven to assurance. I was also driven to hope. And when I say assurance, I mean comforted. Have you ever heard a song before and been just pumped up? Maybe you were motivated before the game started or you're driving in a car, getting ready for a big interview. Have you ever been driven to tears by a song? Have you ever been driven to reminded of, of love or a moment or history? Have you ever been encouraged, driven to hope? Have you ever had your anxieties and your worries and your fears and all of those things literally calmed by lyrical truths that drove you to that emotion? We see that this, this morning. We see the beauty in the lyrics of in Christ alone, in the hope that we're needed that this song points us to. In Christ alone was written by two men, Stuart Townsend and Keith Getty, and it was written and produced in 2002. I was telling Brother Stoney here, like, I was very surprised at that. I've told you guys this every week. I am not very educated when it comes to music. I have very little talent there. I can sing with a group of people, but not alone. And I don't have a good mind concerning the history of music. I didn't have a good understanding of Amazing Grace, let alone in Christ alone. So in my mind, this sounds very hymnal-like, and it does. This song in the music industry, those circles, they see this as a modern, a contemporary hymn, which is kind of an oxymoron. It kind of doesn't fit together. So when I heard this song, I thought this song was much, much older, but it was written, produced, honestly, in 2002. 
So these two men, these, these very strong believers, lovers of the church, these musicians, these songwriters, these authors, they come together and they write a song, they sit on a table. And the story is, as they sit around this table and they start putting notes together, they had the desire, they already had the tune, but they had the desire to write a song that was driven by the simplicity of our foundation. They said, we wanted to write a song based and driven by Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, and how that foundation impacts the everyday man in everyday ways, the effects of being a believer. What does our foundation give us? What does being a Christian mean to our Monday through Sunday? How does his life How does his death, how does his resurrection affect us? We see very plainly, and probably my my favorite line in all of this song, we see it in the first line of the lyrics, in Christ alone. In Christ alone, in no other way, no other answer, no other leader, no other moment, but in Christ alone. We see John say this, that no one can come to the Father except through me. In Christ alone, my hope is found. What is needed more to you this morning in this moment of stressful, uneasy time? Answers are hope. What we see in this beautiful song, in Christ alone. Not this country, not this man, not this moment. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light. He is my strength. He is my song. He is my hope. I want you to hang on this this morning. As I told you, we're going to jump through different verses in Romans. I want you to see this in Romans 8, 16. This is really where this sermon really was inspired by. Before I had one uh, word on the paper, I had Romans 16, and this is really what inspired this whole message of the Christ and the gospel and this beautiful song giving us hope in a time where we might feel hopeless. In those moments where you might forget that he is our answer, he is our strength, he is our song, he is our hope, Romans 8, 16 gives us good news. The Spirit himself bears witness The Spirit, if you are a believer this morning, the Spirit, the living God that lives within you, He bears witness. With who? You. I love this verse. As we find ourselves as people of Romans 7, of man, I want to please God, but I keep walking in sin. I keep struggling. I keep forgetting Romans 8.18. I keep forgetting that this world is not compared for the, for the blessings of tomorrow. I keep forgetting all of those things. It can't be general. Where is my hope? I seek answers. Here's the good news. It's not about your strength. It's not about your effort. It says that the spirit that lives within you bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, that in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our weariness, if you are on E, driving on fumes this morning, the spirit that lives within you, where does hope come from? The spirit that lives within you is reminding your inner self who you are, and that is a child of God. And this song gives me hope, and this scripture gives me assurance. This song gives me hope in Christ alone, no matter our circumstances. In Christ alone, you are my strength. You are my song. This week was hard for me, probably just as hard as it was for you. I felt like just literally just everything um, just was magnified in issues this week. My phone was just ringing off the hook and everybody who'd call me, their, their daughter was sick or they were sick or they had a family member sick. It just seemed like the increased numbers were just magnified this week and everybody I talked to was 
either fearful or struggling or stressed or overwhelmed or not doing well. I had a lot of people in the hospital. I had a few people die this week. My wife's cousin, who's a young woman who has children, sweet woman died unexpectedly out of nowhere this week, broke her heart. This this week, um, the man who married my wife and I, Brother Sonny Daniels, loved this man, sweet, sweet pastor. Older in life, he falls, he hits his head, and he passes away this week as well. I had friends, I had loved ones that I really, really, really care about have doctor's appointments and um, it brought stress and worry into their life and I was burdened by this. I was praying hard for, for my brothers and my sisters that I knew that were struggling this week. It seemed like this week I had a hard time just sucking it up. I had a hard time smiling. I had a hard time lacing it up, grinding through being positive. I just had a hard time. And man, I found so much comfort in God's word, the spirit that lives within me, and the song that we sing. In Christ alone, Hunter. In Christ alone, not your ability, not your effort, not your strength, not your circumstances, not the answers you wish would come. But in Christ alone, we are given hope. And as believers, We seek hope, not simply satisfied with answers. I love the lyrics. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are stilled and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. As believers, and I just want you to take a second Take a second in the midst of all of this chaos and take comfort. Take comfort that this is not resting on you. That the answer to all of this, the outcome, the ending, is not resting on you. That God is in control, that Christ is our foundation, that no one that he calls his will be plucked from his hand, that you are children of the high king. Take comfort that when we are people of Romans 7, the Lord wants us to be genuine followers of people of Romans 8. That when our hearts are broken and our minds are shut down, the Holy Spirit is working a mighty work in you, in me, in all who follow him. That we can be faithful, that we can have hope in moments that answers are hard to come by. Romans 8, 16, we read it once. I just want you to see it again. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Why would we need that? Just take a second. Why would we need that? Why do you need to tell me something I already know? When life, when anybody has to tell you something that you already know, it's because you so easily forget. The Holy Spirit that lives within us God himself is reminding your inner being in the midst of Romans 7 moments that this world is not worthy to be compared to the next, that you are men and women of Romans 8. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit of who you are, and that is a child of God, that when we are weak, that when we doubt, when we fear, when we struggle, That in Christ alone, as believers, the Holy Spirit is doing a mighty work in reminding you that you are not Roman 7, but Roman 8 followers of Christ. Our new identity, children of God, hope when answers cannot be given. So we ask the question, how is this all going to play out? How is this all going to end? What's the outcome, short and long? Our country... Our family, our homes, our jobs, our schools, our church. How is this going to end? And the truth is, I don't know. I don't know. But one thing I do know is that God is in control. And whatever happens to his children is for our good and his glory. And that no one that he calls his will be plucked away. And the church will always survive from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. I want to take a second 
And I want you to just look at Romans 8, and I want us to lean on some truths for us to gather to encourage ourselves past this sermon this morning. I want you to look at the verses in Romans 8. Go to verse 5. What is the Spirit actually doing in us? I hear you, Hunter, that it's reminding us when I forget, when I struggle, he's picking me up. I get it, Hunter. I hear your words. But I want you to see in Scripture what exactly is the Spirit doing? Where does hope come from? Look at verses 5 through 9. For Paul says, For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is a life and a peace. Because the carnal minded is enemy against God, and it is not subject to the law, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hear none. But you are not flesh. But you are not flesh, but in the Spirit, but indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit, he cannot He is not his. You know, I'm a very goal-oriented individual. I'm motivated. Um, I'm a goal setter. I like New Year's resolutions. Whenever I struggle, whenever I fall back into fear or worry, I like to put my desires on paper. I like to work towards a goal. I like to push forward. That's how my mind works. That's how I've succeeded in a lot of things in life in the midst of turmoil. So when I read verses like, Romans 8, 5 through 9, I love them. Set your minds on the things of the Spirit. I love verses like that. I'm very motivated by verses like that. Hunter, gird up your loins. Focus your attention. But as I was reading it this week, is that really what Paul's saying? Is that really the good news? Is that, Hunter, you can do this? Hunter, put one foot in front of the other. You're a child of God. Push forward, brother. Focus on Christ and Christ will do good for you. Is that the message? Is that the good news? I don't think it's what Paul is saying. Whenever I have read Romans 8, 5 through 9, when it says, set your minds, I usually read that as like a motivational pep talk to focus, not really on what Christ has done and continues to do in my life through the Holy Spirit dwelling within me. What Paul is saying is that the Holy Spirit is at work in our mindset. That Christ, not I, not what I have done or what will do by motivational verses of I can, but what Christ has done in me through the transformation that my mind is different because of what God has done in me. He is not saying, hey, Hunter, eyes on me, brother, focus. He is saying, God has allowed me to focus. God is doing work. God is reminding. God is transforming. God is strengthening. God is delivering hope. Not you, not I. I want you to see this, church. It's very important. For the lost and for the saved, we all live in a very storm-tossed existence. It rains just as hard on the just and on the unjust. We see this in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus would say, when he's talking about the foundation on the rock and the sand, it rains on both. What Paul is saying here is that peace and hope does not come from man's strength. It doesn't come from our inner being. But we are hearing in Romans 8 is that our inner being loses sight very easily. But the good news is, is that God who dwells in in us does not allow it to, to drift as easy as we would allow it to drift. That our strength, that our peace, that our comfort, that our hope comes from Christ alone. I spent time on the phone with Jeff and Pam Gottshaw this week. It was just one example of where my heart was broken and burdened. We love Jeff, and we love Pam, and Jeff is not doing very well right now. And it breaks my heart to to see Jeff like that, and it breaks my heart to talk to Pam in such a stressful situation. But every time I get off the phone with them, I'm encouraged. 
I'm not encouraged by their circumstances, and I'm not encouraged by the unanswered questions that seem to live on their day-to-day of, is he going to get better? How much time? What are the doctors going to say? Is this working? No, 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 I'm not encouraged by any of that. I'm encouraged by the hope that is so obviously shown by what God is doing in these people. I'm so encouraged by the strength, not by just strong Southern people. No, because they're not strong enough for this. I'm not strong enough for this. They're not wise enough for this. They're not experienced for this. They're not ready for this. But God who dwells in them is with them in all of this. What do they need? Do they need answers or hope? Does Mr. Jeff need how many days he has left or does he need hope? When I say hope, remember, I don't mean fingers crossed what's going to happen. Biblically, the Bible teaches us that hope is living with expectancy of what we already know. Is that I am a child of God and that my Father is here and will return. Do you read verse 9 as we talk about where does hope come from? What is Christ doing? Do you read verse 9? Do you see hope in that? But you are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. He says, hey, listen, you are not a broken down individual because you're not man. You are something else now. You have been transformed. You were created in the image of God. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. And if indeed in the Spirit of God, God dwells in you. We are man and we are woman living in the midst of a pandemic, a political crisis within our country, an overall huge question mark hangs over most everything you do. And in the midst of all of those facts, we are also men and women who are not of this world. We see we find hope in Romans 18, that we can live genuinely with the mindset of, I hope this works out. I pray that these answers are answered, but my peace comes from knowing that my Father's in control, that I'm in His hand, His Spirit lives within me, and glory awaits. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. These are not fun times, church. There's a lot of unresolved answers, but our hope is worth more than answers. I mean, write that down. My hope is worth more than answers. And sleep well tonight on that. That is how you know you're a child of God. God, I am resting easy tonight because all of the chaos, I praise your name. I praise your name in the midst of the chaos because my hope is is worth more than their answers. Romans 8.16, I just want to read it to you again. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We so easily forget, we so easily stumble, we so easily struggle, and the Spirit of God is reminding you exactly who you are in Him. In Christ alone. As we close, I I want you to see the progression. I want you to see the progression. As we pray and we start to wrap up and we close, I want you to see from the bird's eye view, tightening it all up, I want you to see the beauty of your reality in His glory. Look at Romans 7, 22. This is what I highlighted in Paul's words as his dilemma of living on earth while trying to please God. In 22 through 25, it says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! I desire to do good. I desire to remember. I desire to be strong. I just can't do it. I'm not strong enough. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This is the weight of our reality. Not strong enough, needing answers, obviously struggling, hopeless. All children of God, where God will bring peace to all of those insecurities. Romans 8, I want you to see the next progression. Romans 8, 9 through 11. But you are not in the flesh. But you are not in the flesh. And if indeed in the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is not of you. Your new mind, your new heart, your calmness, your peace, your genuineness of being able to live, Romans 8.18, is not you. What Pam is experiencing, what Jeff is experiencing, is not them. This is God who lives in them, pouring in hope to the hopeless. The lyrics say, There in the ground his body lay, Lie to the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, Sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For this earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Look at 25 as we conclude. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with it with perseverance. That's who we are today. We are transformed, born again, peace-driven lovers of Christ, eagerly waiting for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercessions For us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. Last verse For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are to be called according to his purpose. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Such words that are needed. Lord, I thank you for your scripture. I thank you for your songs. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your church. Lord, I know that whatever peace I experience is nothing to do with me and all to do with you. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for that cross. We thank you for that spirit. Lord, keep us faithful. Keep us strong. Give us wisdom. Lord, I pray that you be with those that are sick, those that are hurting. Spirit, remind us who we are in hope, that we are children of the King. In your precious and holy name, amen.